No other New Testament book is quite like James. Catchy, practical, and in your face. The book of James jumps straight into the nitty gritty of daily life. James doesn't just want us hearing what God says. He wants us doing what God says. You can't read James without being confronted. He steps on your toes. At times, he punches you in the gut. And through it all, James wants us to see what God is doing and then join him in it. Well, I hope you had a great 4th of July for those of you at all of our campuses. For some of my friends, this is their favorite holiday of the year, uh, which feels a little bit sacrilegious to me. But um, on Tuesday morning, one of them greeted me with a meme uh, from that great theologian, Ron Swanson, uh, saying history began on July 4th, 1776. Everything before that was a mistake. That is not entirely true, which brings us to the Bible. So if you have your Bibles, uh, why don't you take them out? But happy 4th of July to everybody as we close out this week. We're going to start a new series this weekend, and that is a series through the book of James. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll want to find the book of James, there are 66 books in your Bible. Uh, James is the 59th of those 66, which means it should be right about there, uh, kind of right toward the end if you're looking where to start uh, looking. And as you're doing that, why don't we just take a moment and let's pray and ask God uh, to teach Teach us the wonderful things he has in this book, in his word. Will you do that? Let's bow it all over our campuses, if you will. Father, your word tells us, James 1, we're going to see it in just a minute, that if we lack wisdom, we should ask from you, who gives generously and without condemnation and reproach. So Lord, I'm asking that. I know that uh, I'm an unworthy man speaking to unworthy people. And God, we come, but we come to a generous God who's not here to lecture and condemn, but here to help and to save so Lord, speak to us out of the generosity in your heart and not the righteousness in ours. God, I've been praying all week long and I'll say it again here publicly, Psalm 34, what King David prayed. Let the afflicted hear and be glad. I pray, Father, that the afflicted in our congregation, whether that's affliction through physical pain or um, an emotional, uh, relational um, uh, tension point or maybe the breaking of a relationship or whether it's spiritual pain, I pray that they would rejoice today because of who you are and what you promise and that the fact that you do all things well. God, I pray that they would learn to trust you. I pray that I would learn to trust you in these moments. We pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Listen, before we dive in, let's just talk for a minute about James the person because that might help you appreciate the approach that this book is going to take. James was the half-brother of Jesus. I say half-brother because they shared Mary as a mother, but Jesus's father, of course, was God since he was immaculately conceived. And for Mary's other children, Joseph would have been the father. John chapter seven, verse five tells us that when Jesus began his ministry, James, along with Jesus's other brothers, didn't really believe that he was the Messiah. That was probably the result of, of jealousy mixed with a little skepticism. I mean, how could the guy who snored next to me in the bunk and smelled weird in the morning, just like the other boys did, how could that be the God who created the universe? But then Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that James met the resurrected Jesus. Now, James was one of the people that Jesus specifically sought out after the resurrection to appear to him. And James, the younger brother of Jesus, came to not only believe in Jesus and worship him as God, he also became the leader of the early church in Jerusalem and one of the early church's first martyrs. By the way, James's conversion is one of the reasons I find the evidence for Jesus's claim so compelling. I mean, think about it. How many of you listening to me right now, how many of you had an older brother? Raise your hand, all right? What would it take for you to start regarding your older brother as God and to worship him? You're like, Satan incarnate, maybe I could get that, but not God. Y'all, James had every reason not to believe in Jesus, but the resurrection changed his mind. James's book takes the practical wisdom of Jesus and it codifies it into punchy, application-ready, bite-sized chunks. It's a very Jewish book. It is straightforward. It is in your face. I love it. It's like the New Testament's book of Proverbs. Here's how it begins. Verse one, 
James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not referring to himself as the half-brother of Jesus because that's not relevant. He's a servant just like you are. To the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. I want you to note that the immediate audience for this book is Jewish Christians. The 12 tribes of Israel, who had been currently scattered around the world, driven out of their homeland, now living in unfamiliar and often hostile territory. But James intends that as a double entendre. Christians, the true Israel, we also have been separated from our homeland, heaven, and now we live in hostile territory. So James is not just thinking about Jewish Christians, he's thinking about all Christians when he writes this. And so his first admonition, verse two, is he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Count it all joy when you go through trials, trials like being separated from your homeland, or for that matter, any kind of trial. He says various trials. He means, I'm not talking about just spiritual trials or persecution. I mean, pain or relational frustration or marriage tension or a friend turning their back on you or career disappointment or wayward kids or whatever. Count it all joy because these trials are tests. And these tests are actually producing good things in you. How many of you like tests? Raise your hand. You were the kind of person in high school or college that you just loved exam day. Why don't you put your hand up? Right, not a whole lot of hands. There's always one or two. I see you out there. There are a few weirdos, okay? You were the ones... You were the ones that threw off the curve for the rest of us, and we all kind of secretly hated you for it, but uh, most of us didn't like tests. I heard about one of our, 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 our college sophomores at UNC Chapel Hill who was in an ornithology class over there. You know what um, ornithology is? Study of birds, that's right. Um, this guy sweated all semester long, he said, in anticipation of the notoriously difficult final exam. Well, having made uh, what he regarded to be the ultimate effort in preparation for this exam, he'd stayed up all night memorizing bird facts and listening to bird calls and trying to be able to identify birds. This young man said he was stunned when he walked into the classroom the next day to take the test because there's no test paper, there's no multiple choice questions, there were no essay prompts, just a single PowerPoint on the screen of 25 different pairs of bird legs with the instruction, identify these birds by their feet. <laughs> this is insane, the student protested. I didn't prepare for this, it's not fair. Well, the professor said, you better give it your best shot because this is your final exam and it's gonna count for half of your grade. This is not fair, he said, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it. This frustrated student said, I'm, I'm walking out. Professor said, if you walk out, then you will fail the final and fail the class. You go ahead and fail me, the boy said, headed for the door. Fine, the professor said, you have failed. Tell me your name, young man. At which point the bull pulled up his pant legs. He's like, you tell me, professor, you tell me what my name is. <laughs> Parts of that story are not true, but tests, <laughs> tests reveal weak spots in our knowledge. But tests can also be opportunities to deepen our knowledge and to fill in the gaps of our understanding. And that's what trials and difficulties do for us, James says. They reveal the weak spots in our faith and give us opportunities to grow in them. Affliction, Tim Keller says, affliction is how we move from abstract knowledge of God to a personal encounter with God. I would dare say that there are many of you in here who have a great deal of facts in your head about God. And yet many of these have never become personal relational encounters they don't move you to worship when we're in here together. They don't well up your heart with emotion. You don't ponder these things in the night hours. They're not where you turn to in a time of emotional distress. And the reason for that is you have never brought God with you into suffering. On the whole, I will tell you, the American church, we do a pretty poor job of preparing us for trials. Most of us assume that life is supposed to be good. A lot of times the church just reinforces that life is good, life is beautiful, and if life's not good, something's wrong. But you gotta understand, that's not been the assumption for most of human history. In previous generations, people expected life to be short and painful and unfair and brutish. Previous generations had no problem believing in an afterlife because this life was so hard. But our culture, Western culture, with all of its conveniences and prosperity and technology, 
It tells us that life should be easy and filled with happiness and zen and fulfillment. And so we are shocked when life goes wrong, which it always does. Despite all of our technology and all our best practices, life is still filled with heartache and disappointment and broken relationships. I don't care how right you do it. And that's gonna happen to the richest and poorest of you alike. In fact, I would dare say some of you are there right now. Bottom line, y'all, we probably need this instruction by James even more than that original audience did. In the next six verses, James is gonna give you three commands that you are to heed when you go through a trial. Those commands are about perspective, patience, and prayer. Here's number one, perspective. Verse two, he tells us, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy when you go through a, 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 a trial. Joy is not what I typically feel in a trial. Typically, I feel what? Anger, especially if my suffering feels unjust, which it usually does. What did I do to deserve this? Why was that person able to get away with that? Why did they get the reward and I didn't? Why did I get passed over? God, where are you? Or I feel despair. You ever feel that? Are things ever gonna change? When is this pain ever gonna go away? Is this relationship ever going to heal? Maybe this weekend you're sitting right there asking, when, when's my big break gonna come? It's come for all my friends. I did better than they did in school, but their big break has come, mine hadn't come. Are these fertility treatments ever gonna work? When am I gonna find my soulmate? And what feels the hardest in these trials is when heaven seems silent. When you pray, it's like nothing changes. Not in you, not in the situation. Am I talking to somebody out there, right? Am I talking to somebody up there? And maybe one thing, if I got a, a no to my request, but one thing if I prayed and God just said, hey, no, not right now. I, that might be disappointing for me, but at least I would know that somebody was up there listening. But silence feel like, feels like God is unmoved and unconcerned. It feels like God's ignoring me. Like, like, like he's ignoring me if he's even there to quote Pastor Tyler Stadden, whose book, Praying Like Monks and Living Like Fools, has a great little chapter on the silence of God. He says, and I quote, silence makes me feel like the only one with the power to stop the disease that is ravaging my mother from the inside out cannot be bothered. Or the only one with the power to open my stubborn womb is too distracted to care. Or the one that I've held my desire for companionship in front of for decades yawns in the face of my loneliness. But James says, count it joy because God is using that test to produce steadfastness in you. He is testing whether or not you actually trust God, whether or not you'll lean on God's character, even when you're surrounded by chaos and confusion or silence, whether or not you can feast on God's presence, the greatest joy in the universe, even when everything else in the around you in the world is leaving you starving. I will tell you from experience that this is one of the hardest things to do in the Christian life. It's what I've, I've called sometimes trusting God in the blank spaces of your life. Do you remember that? The blank spaces in your life are those spaces in your life when it feels like God's absent, like he's not doing anything. I actually take the term from the life of David, 1 Samuel 16, 13. Samuel has anointed David to be the king of Israel. And as the oil of anointing is still wet on David's head, Samuel gets up and leaves. And then the narrative on David's life just stops. And then there's this blank space between verses 13 and 14. Scholars say the narrative on David's life will not pick up again for about seven years. All that is represented by that little blank space in your Bible. And I gotta ask, what were those seven years like? What's it like to be anointed king of Israel and then go back to the pasture for seven years? I mean, David didn't run down to the palace, start trying on robes. He didn't go on a speaking tour to explain his vision for Israel. Didn't do an interview with Israel's GQ magazine or whatever it was back then. He went back to the pasture where he followed sheep around for seven years. Not like a week, not an afternoon, but seven years. Imagine the boredom, the tedium, the confusion. God, I thought you wanted me to be king. Those seven years were a blank space where God's writing in David's life seemed to stop. And yet... And yet we learn later that during that season was when God was actually doing some of his best writing in David. It was there in the pasture, in the pasture that David developed the courage and the skill with the slingshot to fight Goliath. It was there in the pasture that he learned the themes that would one day emerge as Psalm 23. This was David's time of trial. 
And it was where God produced steadfastness in David, which David could not have learned any other way. David, as you and I know him, became David in that little blank space in your Bible between 1 Samuel 16, verses 13 and 14. Change your perspective, count it joy. Because there is a good and sovereign God, James says, that is at work at you in the trial. Y'all, this is important, listen to this. Joy is not a feeling that overcomes you. Many people are waiting on a feeling of God getting us and Holy Ghost hallelujahs to just take them over. That ain't ever gonna happen. Joy is a byproduct of believing the promises of God in the midst of great pain. You may feel the same, but in the promises of God, listen to this, your heart and your mind elevate to a peace and joy above your feelings because you are overcoming the world. God has not called you to a joy in the world, but to a joy that overcomes the world, which leads to the second command. Number two, patience. In patience, James says, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Y'all listen to this really clearly. Trials do not automatically produce good in you. I think it was Friedrich Nietzsche who said, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Nietzsche was not a Christian and that statement is not true. There are a lot of things that do not kill you that make you weaker and much worse as a person. Trials do not automatically produce good in you. For many, unexplained pain produces bitterness and doubt and despair. You gotta choose whether you're gonna trust and hold on to God's good character and let him work his good in you, but that transformation is not automatic. Yo, listen, it's like Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century British pastor used to say, times of doubt and trial, they're like a foot poised to go forwards or backwards in faith. This trial, he said, can indeed take you forward with God, further in with God, but that trial can also drive you backwards into unbelief. Reminds me of the story of the little bird it was flying south for the winter, but the bird got a late start. His, you know, overslept his alarm or whatever, and all his friends were gone. So because he got a late start, he got caught in a snowstorm. The storm was so bad that ice formed on his little wings and he couldn't even fly, so he came down for a crash landing. He couldn't get back up because his wings are frozen and he thought, great, now I'm gonna freeze to death out here by myself. But then suddenly a cow came along and how do I say this politely, took a, Took a dump on him, can I say that? Okay, just drop manure on him. First, the little bird thinks that things have gone from bad to worse, but then he realizes that the manure is warming his wings and is thawing them. He's gonna be able to fly again. And so he got so excited that he began to chirp and to sing, but that attracted a cat who comes along and eats him. And the lessons from this great little parable are three. <laughs> Lesson number one, not everyone who drops manure on you is your enemy. Lesson number two, not everyone who digs you out is your friend. And the most important lesson, number three, when you're in manure, sometimes it's helpful just to keep your little chirper shut and see what God is up to, which is why we have this command. It's what James is saying. Let steadfastness have its full effect. Let God do his work. There's times you just gotta be still. You don't need an answer. You're not gonna get an answer. You just gotta rest in the character of your heavenly father. I think about Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, unjustly imprisoned, publicly whipped and humiliated, sitting in the darkness of a prison cell, their lacerated backs leaning up against that cold, filthy dungeon wall at midnight. And what are they doing? What are they doing? You know the story. They start singing out their worship. What were they singing? We don't know exactly, but I'm sure it was something about God's character and his faithfulness. There they are, open wounds, unjustly imprisoned, in pain, alone, and they're singing, God is so good. He's so good. He's so good to me. And the jailer listening to them cannot believe it. He's like, what's, what's wrong with you guys? How is this happening? And then God sends an earthquake and the prison walls fall down and their chains fall off and the jailer falls on his knees before them. And he says, what must I do to be saved? In other words, what do I have to do to have this kind of joy in a moment like this one? That earthquake was just a physical manifestation of the soul quake that Paul and Silas had gone through in trusting in the good character of God, even in the midst of their darkness. Their prison walls falling were one thing. More important were the walls that kept them from leaning into the good character of God in the midst of pain and darkness. Listen to me, every great Bible hero, all of them had a moment where they had to choose. 
Am I gonna trust in the good character of God, the character that I see demonstrated in the cross and the resurrection? Or am I gonna let this chaos push me into disbelief and despair? Are you gonna anchor your soul in God's character and let God do his work and let steadfastness have its full effect? Because only then, he says, only then can you be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Do you get that? You wanna be perfect and complete? It's only through perseverance in suffering that you can be perfect and complete. There are things about God you can only learn in suffering. I would dare say we got a lot of people here who they love signing up for Bible studies because they want to know God better. And that's awesome. But I would bet that if we had a way for you to sign up for suffering, I'm guessing nobody would sign up for that. James says, yeah, but there are dimensions of God that you will only know from the heart when you suffer. There is a part of Christian maturity that can only come through pain, through darkness, and through unanswered questions. It's like Martin Luther, the reformer, always said, three things make for a great Christian. Three are necessary. Prayer, Bible study, and suffering. None of us want pain, me included. The question is, do you want to know God more than you want to avoid pain? If so, then you will count it joy when you go through trials and you will patiently let steadfastness have its full effect. I don't mean you're seeking out pain. I just mean that when life brings it to you, instead of getting bitter, you're gonna turn to God and say, God, this is joy because this is how you can produce Christ in me, which leads me to the third command and that command is prayer. If any of you lacks wisdom, James says, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. We'll come back to that. And it's gonna be given to him Hey, I got good news for you, brothers and sisters. God will help you. God will give you the wisdom, the direction, the insight, and whatever other resources your soul needs for this to make you better and not bitter. But, but there is a condition and it is a very important condition. And it is the reason that many of you are not receiving help from the Lord right now in your trial. Verse six, let him ask in faith with no doubting, For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not suppose that he or she will receive anything from the Lord because that's a double-minded man and they are unstable in all their ways. Now, let me just be very, very clear with you. When James says, do this with no doubting, he does not mean you never have questions and that you live at all times with absolute certainty about what God is doing and feelings of peace that overwhelm you. That is not what he is saying. Every Christian I know struggles at times with doubts and confusion. It's not what James is talking about. What James is saying is that when you go through trials, you can't hedge your bets. The word doubt is literally in Greek, if you have your Greek New Testament open, you'll see it. It says, die psychos. Die to psychos minds. Means your loyalties are divided. You're of two minds. That means on Sunday, you're praying to God, asking him to fix your problems. But then on Monday, you take matters into your own hands and do it your way. On Sunday, you're like, God, I need you to work in my marriage. God, I need you to work in my marriage. But on Monday, you're punishing your spouse or you're trying to manipulate them or you're feeling justified in being unfaithful to them. On Sunday, you're like, God, I need you to work in my finances. But on Monday, you switch to plan B, which is to, uh, what, cheat on your taxes or overcharge your customers or stop giving your tithe. What you're doing is you're hedging your bets. You're asking God to work, but you're not really leaning all of your confidence on him. You are of die psychos, two minds. Tony Evans, uh, the pastor says that a lot of us have a mutual fund approach to trusting God. Here's what he means by that. If you've ever invested in the stock market, you know a mutual fund is a way of spreading out your investment risk. Instead of putting all your money into one company, which could either go really good or really bad, A mutual fund spreads out your investment over dozens and hundreds of companies so that if one of those companies fails, you will make it up with the others. You may not get the spike, you know, that you would get if you just put all your chips on one company, but it's a way of mitigating your risk. That is fine as an investment strategy, but it will not work in your relationship with God. If you're gonna receive any help from God, you gotta lean all your confidence in him and do things his way. Some of you look at me and you're like, well, God's not helping me in my situation. Well, my question, first question to you is gonna be, have you leaned all your hope into him? Because if not, you should not suppose that you will receive anything from the Lord because you are dipsychos. You are dipsychos with God. It is full of trust or it is nothing. Now, when I say you lean all your weight on God, do I mean that you're doing absolutely nothing to fix your problem? Like if you pray for healing, then you should not go to the doctor. No, I am not saying that. God expects us to be active in solving our problems, but 
there is a way of doing that and being active that is still fully dependent on God. And it would always show up in two ways. The first way it shows up if you're very active but dependent on God is you're leaving the ultimate outcome of the situation to him. And when you lay your head on your pillow at night, you are at rest because ultimately God's in charge of your problem, not you. And then the second quality, if you're being active while dependent on God, is that you refuse to step outside of God's will to get things done. James says, it is only when you lean all your confidence onto him that you're gonna get any help from him. Here's a word picture I've used over the years to illustrate this. And I was looking back through my notes and don't believe I've told this in a while, so I feel like it's time again. When I was in high school, some friends of mine and I got into rock climbing and rappelling. Now, both rock climbing and rappelling, they both involve scaling a rock face and ropes. But with rock climbing, you're moving up and down the mountain by means of your arms and your legs, and the rope serves as basically your safety line. But in rappelling, you have transferred all of your weight off of your arms and your legs onto the rope. Well, the first time this little group of four friends of mine and I, five of us total, decided to go rappelling, one of the guys in our group claimed that he knew how to do it. Now, looking back, I can tell you with full certainty, he had no idea what he was talking about. And it is a genuine New Testament miracle that I'm standing up here in front of you today. But at 16 years old, your safety standards just aren't as high. All right, at any rate, when we got up to the top of this rock face, my friend asked for a volunteer who wanted to go first. That should have been my first clue that he did not know what he was doing because he didn't want to go first. He wanted one of us to go first. Somehow I got nominated in the group to go first. And so I hooked into the blaze system or whatever. And I remember that incredible moment when he told me to lean back over the edge on this rock face and just fall backwards. Y'all, it felt like the most unnatural thing in the world. You were leaning backwards into what feels like a headlong plunge into certain death. Before leaning my weight back, I stood there. I, it was at least a minute, which I know doesn't sound like a long time, but just standing there terrified for your life, it's a long time. And I stood there for a solid minute, just asking myself, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? I prayed and asked Jesus to come into my heart again, right? It, it, that would inspire a book one day. But, 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 but at that moment, I was just like, come back into my heart, Jesus. I did this just in case those guys were right, right? Just have all my bases covered. My friends are all cheering me on. I'm quite confident that if my manhood had not been on the line, there is no way that I would have done it. But it was on the line. And so I just kind of held my, closed my eyes and was like, well, I can't be, you know, thought of as a girly man. So I just leaned back and I leaned back. And I remember when the rope caught me, and my expert friend looked relieved. And he was like, you know, like, what do you know? Then I summoned up all my courage, y'all. I mean, just all my courage. And I leap with all my might and I moved down maybe two inches. Just like, you know, right down. And then I did it again with a bigger jump and then a bigger jump. Soon enough, I was at the bottom. Well, my best friend, my best friend at the time, he was second in line behind me. And uh, he was even more scared of heights than I was. From 75 feet below, I could see him. I could see him shaking. Now, one thing about my best friend, he was better looking than I was. He was more athletic than I was, more popular with the girls than I was. So I hated this kid, but he was my best friend in the whole world. And so it was with great delight, great delight that I saw how scared he was. I mean, you know, again, I'm from 75 feet, I can see his, his knees shaking. He must've stood there y'all for 10 minutes, trying to work up the courage to lean back. And after about 10 minutes, he held the rope, saw him hold the rope really tight. He stretched one foot back and found a little place on the rock. Then he found another and he began to shimmy his way down the face of the rock. Now, was he repelling? No, he was climbing down the rock using the rope as a safety line. And there is a world of difference between repelling and climbing with the rope as a safety line. To really repel, you gotta, you gotta transfer all your trust to the rope. Well, here's the thing. There was a point in this rock wall where the rock face quit going at this angle and kind of sort of curved and went back at this angle. And ain't nobody, ain't nobody strong enough to climb upside down. So when my friend got to that point on the rock wall, he hovered for a few minutes in indecision, looking for a foothold, and then he just climbed back up. Let that vertex in the rock wall, let that represent a trial in your life. And in that trial, it gets revealed whether you're really trusting God with your life, leaning all your weight on him, or whether you're using him as a safety net while you hedge your bets with other things. James says the only kind of faith that's gonna get you through a severe trial, the only kind of faith that's gonna get you over that vertex, the only kind of faith that's gonna get heaven's help is the faith that leans all of its weight on God. Is that what you're doing? Y'all listen, Jesus repeatedly warned that there would be times when it feels like God is not responding to your prayers. 
I know some of you pray and it feels like nothing's happening. And you think, well, this is just me. I bet JD doesn't ever feel that way. I bet the really spiritual people in my small group, but they don't feel that way. No, we all feel that way. You know how I know that? Jesus told a parable because he knew we felt that way. Luke 18, one says, Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they should always pray and not lose heart. He knew sometimes we were gonna pray and we would lose heart because it felt like nothing was happening and nobody was listening. And then Jesus proceeds to tell a story about a woman who wants justice from this old, crooked, cranky, uncaring judge. So she keeps asking and asking and asking and asking. And through her relentless request, the judge finally relents and gives her what she asked for. The point of that parable, of course, It's not to compare God to an unjust judge and imply that he is crooked or uncaring. It is to contrast God with one. And the point is, if even a corrupt judge gave this woman justice because of her relentless persistence, how much more will God see that our persistent prayers get answered also? Did you know that the Bible says that God, listen to this. Did you know that the Bible says that God collects two things of yours? He collects two things. Number one, your tears. And number two, your prayers. Psalm 56, six says, you have kept count of my tossings and you have put my tears in your bottle. Every tear you've ever wept in any trial you've ever had, your heavenly father has kept those in a bottle. He's kept your prayers too. I love this scene from the book of Revelation. And the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are what? Those golden bowls are filled with the prayers of the saints. For years and years and years and years, the saints have prayed. You and me have prayed. We prayed for justice. We prayed for help. And sometimes it felt like we were being ignored, but God had heard every single one of those prayers and he kept them all in those golden bowls. I love how Tyler Statton again says it. Every prayer that you have ever whispered from the simplest throwaway request to the most heartfelt cry, God has collected it like a grandmother who scraps books, a toddler's finger paints and scribbles. God has treasured up every prayer we have ever uttered, even the ones we've forgotten. And he's still weaving their fulfillment, bending history in the direction of a great yes to you and to me. In fact, when God brings the final restoration to the earth, you've probably never seen this. When God brings the final restoration to the earth, it starts with those golden bowls filled with prayers just being turned over. Revelation 8, and another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and he filled it with fire from the altar and he threw it down onto the earth. And there were peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Every prayer you pray, God puts into a bowl. There are these bowls in heaven that are just brimming with cries for healing and for justice and restoration and vindication. Some of them are prayers that I have prayed. A lot of times God answers our prayers right now, but sometimes God delays and you pray for 30 or 40 years before getting an answer. You pray and you pray and you pray for that prodigal and it's 30 years before God takes that bowl and he turns it over and he brings them home. And sometimes you die without receiving the answer and you think God has ignored you, but he's kept every single one. And the final restoration of the earth begins with God giving a categorical and unequivocal yes to all those prayers that we and every other saint have prayed since the beginning of history. God has not missed a single one that you've ever prayed. And Revelation 8 tells you that there is coming a moment where God answers yes to all of them. In the end, every prayer of a believer is an answered prayer. Not one tear you've shed or one prayer you've ever prayed has God missed. And soon he is coming with redemption for all of them. In the end, every prayer of a believer is an answered prayer. So James's question is, are you gonna approach God without doubting? You're gonna approach God with that kind of confidence? In the midst of all the chaos of your life, are you gonna hold on to the character of God like I held on to that repelling rope? James 1, 5, one more time. If If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Who gives generously? By the way, in Greek, it says literally there, ask the giving God. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask the giving God who gives generously to all without reproach. Without reproach means without condemnation or shame or disapproval. You come to God and you're like, I got this problem. And you feel like you were the one that created the problem. God didn't wag his finger and lecture you about all the ways that you got yourself in this mess. 
Now he responds with tenderness and generosity like I do one of my kids when they're hurt. One of my daughters comes home with a broken heart after being betrayed by a friend or treated meanly by some boy. I don't respond with a life lesson about how she should have better protected herself. If there's a life lesson in there for her, we'll get to that later. For now, all I wanna do is give her comfort and help and go find that person who hurt them and punch them in the face, right? <laughs> but the point is my girl has a broken heart and I wanna help. This is what God does when he comes to us in the midst of our pain and our mess. By the way, I love that phrase, he gives to all. I love words like all in the Bible because he's trying to say, I know you think you're the exception. You're not all. No matter who you are, what you've done, no matter how you've messed your life up, no matter how complicated you've made this, no matter how much of the problem you're in is really your fault, the giving father radiates with openness and love and a readiness to help. Is that how you think about God when you pray to him? One of the old Christian mystics, her name was Julian of Norwich. She used to ask, when you pray, this is a great question, when you pray, what expression do you see on God's face? Is it an expression that's stern and serious, kind of angry, kind of condemning? Maybe when you pray, you see a God that is you know, kind of aloof and disinterested, looking the other direction, paying attention to much more important things as you're desperately trying to get his attention. Or, or is it that when you pray, you see the face of a friend turn towards you full of inviting and happiness and peace and comfort. When you pray, see the God that is presented here in James 1, 5, because seeing God that way will enable you to persevere through this trial with patience and even count it as joy. Y'all, I said it before, I'll say it again. Every biblical hero in the midst of what felt like God's absence and silence came to a point where they defiantly and rebelliously and boldly said, I choose trust. I choose trust because this God to whom I'm praying is not a God who looked down loftily and apathetically on my pain from heaven. He is a God who entered into my pain. He looks at those in pain from level ground. He went to a cross. He suffered with me in my pain so that he could redeem me from my pain. This is not a God who is powerless in the face of disease or death or defeat. This was a God who was driven by disease and death and defeat into a grave. But then three days later, he burst out of that grave victoriously with a promise to do the same for me. So I choose trust. I choose trust. I wanna close, I wanna close by sharing the story of a woman named Emily who actually lived out James 1. I actually do not know this woman personally, but she was kind enough to share these thoughts from her journal. I wanna read you a couple of pages from her journal. It's totally worth it, okay? She says, here's her first journal entry. If you had asked me what I was thankful for, before September, I would have said that I was thankful for my family, my home, my job, for a husband who loves and cares for me, for four children aged 14, 11, nine, and five who are healthy and happy. I would thank him for a home that I never dreamed that I could have, for a career that I love that allows me to work from home, and for a good and generous God who has provided me all these things regardless of my unworthiness. In September though, completely out of the blue, my husband left me and our four children for somebody else who left her husband and two children as well. This other family were friends of ours. We vacationed with them on three separate occasions. I thought this woman was my friend. When she and my husband betrayed me, my heart died within me. This couldn't be happening. My Christian husband, the one who had assured our kids that while divorce does happen in this messed up world, it would never happen to us. That we had made a covenant, a promise to God and to each other, no matter what, we will always be here for each other and for them. This is the man that was leaving. I asked what he was going to tell the kids and he said he didn't know. I told him, you can't just leave without telling the kids something. Surely I thought this would hit him. He wouldn't be able to look at these precious children and tell them that he was leaving but he did. He called him back downstairs out of bed and told them that he was leaving. They didn't understand. Was this for work? When will you be back, daddy? No kids, I'm moving out not to come back anymore. He left. We were crushed. God, is this really your plan? How could this be your will for our lives? I know, I know that you will heal my heart. I know that something good will come from this, but how? 
I've never been so angry. Our poor children are suffering terribly. Their father's wants come before their needs. He says, I still love my kids. Really? How can you love them and cause them such pain? Next journal entry, four months later. God is beginning to heal me in a way that I'm not sure I wanna be healed. I wanna see justice, but I know it's not mine to inflict. I'm beginning to try to pray for him and not just about him. Praying for him to come back, not to me, but back to God. I have to forgive him to get through the bitterness, but how am I going to make it? God says, pray, so I do. I'm praying for a miracle for him to snap out of this and to find his way back home, but I'm also moving forward now without him. Final journal entry. Six months later, it's now been six months. My situation has gotten worse. And yet I feel truly blessed. My husband's still gone, still with his girlfriend. He's told me that they will be a part of our kids' lives and I need to get used to that and not hate her. He told me that if she is my enemy, then I am his. My kids are still dealing with the impact that their daddy left. They're depressed, they're angry, they're confused, and they're frustrated. My oldest has started questioning his faith. He is rebelling against all authority. He's lashing out at his family. My house is up for sale, a short sale, which could probably turn into a foreclosure. And yet, and yet in the midst of all this, I've come to know God on a different level, to see God work in a way that I'd only ever heard about. To experience this is quite amazing. I've never had a big tragedy in my life, never really had to fully rely on God. I mean, sure, I prayed and I saw God work, but not like this. Before, when I needed God's comfort, the image in my head was me clinging to Jesus and him hugging me. My image now is me completely collapsed and him carrying me. And it is awesome. In the midst of this horrible situation, I see glimpses of what God is doing and how my life and our lives will be changed. And I get excited to see who I get to be at the end of all this. It's like being in a race where it starts to rain and you hit a mud pit, you can't go around it, you have to go through it. And the rain and the mud are weighing you down, you can't go through it fast, you gotta concentrate on each painful step, but at the same time, something is keeping you upright and something is compelling you to continue. In the distance, you see what appears to be a sheet of rain, almost like a car wash rinse, and then you see it, the sun. It is perfectly clear. The person you will be there will be stronger and filled with peace. I can't wait to use what God has taught me. I've explained it to my children like this. In every fairy tale, there's always a tragedy and the protagonist faces that adversity, overcomes it and thrives because of it. God is giving us our fairy tale, I tell them. Can you see him there at the end? Here's my question for you. Can you trust God like that? Can you embrace the mystery and hold on to the goodness of God in the midst of this trial? Now listen, I know I'm talking to some people in here right now that you're in a trial. And maybe you need the wisdom that James is talking about. The command is to pray. Or maybe you need the Spirit's resources to persevere. Good news, friend, you got a generous giving God who stands here today without reproach. He's not up here to give you a lecture, to wag his finger at you and tell you all the things you did wrong. He is ready to receive you and to help you for you to turn over control to him and say, God, I'm here. He is ready to help. He is ready to save to the uttermost those who come to him. So that's what I want us to do. We're gonna open up the altars at all of our campuses. Why don't you come and why don't you ask God for that kind of help? If any of you lack wisdom or resources or anything else, come and let him ask of God who will give generously to all without reproach. It will be fully given to you. Let prayer be your first act of declaring, I choose trust. Prayer teams, let me invite you if you would, half a dozen of you come up around the altars here at our campuses. And Summit, when I stand you up here in just a minute, our worship leader is gonna come. And if that's you, if you're in the midst of a trial, you need wisdom or strength. The moment I stand you up, I want you just to step out into the aisle and come up around these altars and pray. If you want somebody to pray with you, that's what these prayer counselors are here for. They'll just look over at them and kind of nod at them and they'll come to you and they'll pray with you. If you just wanna pray by yourself around the altar, that's great too, just come and kneel down. But if you want one of us to pray with you, just look at us and we'll come, okay? Our worship teams are coming up right now. Summit Church, let's stand to our feet, if we would. Stand to our feet. And if that's you, friend, just right now, step out into the aisle and come to the altar. 
Come to this altar and receive the help that you're generous and giving God is ready to give. You come right now. Come right now as our worship teams come.